Let's move the fence. I'm gonna go 10 inches. Whoa! Okay, that's good. <laughs> yes! You have no idea how long it's taken to get to this point. <laughs> Beautiful! This is the first project I've ever written any code for. And when you consider that I had to create a user interface, respond to sensors, control multiple motors, and an e-stop, this was quite the challenge. But the feeling you get when you hit that button and the machine does what you want it to do, it's kind of like discovering you have a superpower. I want to walk you through the journey of the design and build process. If you want to copy the code or get the 3D model, I'll make all of that available for free. It all started with a simple problem. I did not trust the fence that I had on my original table saw. It was just awful, and I found myself constantly checking it and micro adjusting it. I got so frustrated one day, I ripped it off and decided I was gonna make a fence that weekend, and I did. Now that's where I started, but then that quickly grew into maybe I could automate the fence. And what if I automated the entire saw? And that's how we ended up where we are today. This project actually started with me disassembling my table saw and removing all the non-essential components. While removing those components, I was also taking measurements and modeling the core body of the table saw. Now I'm a total amateur when it comes to rust removal, so I tried a little bit of everything. I used navel jelly, which is this pink stuff you're supposed to just rub on, let it sit for a while and rinse it off. I tried griming the top with a wire wheel and that was really labor intensive. Then I decided to search the internet and I found that a lot of people soak their items in vinegar and then they try to get the rust off. Except my problem was I didn't have anything big enough to soak the whole table in. I came up with this idea of putting a towel on top and then soaking the towel in vinegar. And I was pretty happy with the results. Well, I must say that for me, this is definitely good enough. There are still a tiny bit of pitting. The work versus reward has crossed that threshold. So I think I'm going to leave it as it is. The next step will be to put something on top of it to preserve it. I have no idea what I'm going to put on there. Uh, give me some recommendations in the comments. I'd love to know what kind of things you guys do to keep your surfaces rust free. The last thing to do was to disassemble the base that the saw rides on now because I'm making a whole new cabinet the parts of the base were integral to the body. So I had to remake the ring that holds all of the side pieces together to make that stable and also hold the dust collector chute in place. Once I designed and cut out that piece on my plasma cutter, it was time to finish the 3D model and start welding up my saw. So let's take a look at how we're gonna automate this thing. There were really three projects built into this. There's the mechanical design, which is gonna physically move all the parts it's going to support everything. There's the electrical design, which serves as the go-between. It's gonna translate the information coming in from the computer and turn that into physical outputs on the mechanical side. And finally, I have the programming itself, which is, in my case, gonna be the programming language Python implemented on a Raspberry Pi. I'm gonna talk more about that in a little bit, but first, let's take a look at the mechanical design. Except for the welder frame, I designed all of these parts in X-Design on the 3D Experience platform. X-Design is made by Dassault Systems, and they're sponsoring this project today. Now, I know some of you, you're saying, Jeremy, I thought you were a SOLIDWORKS man. I am. See? My first exposure to X-Design actually happened last year at 3D Experience World, which formerly was called SOLIDWORKS World. It's all made by the same company. What made it appealing to me is that it works through your browser, it's all in the cloud. That means I have access to all of my data and all of my models anywhere in the world, at any time, on any device. If I'm standing in the shop with my iPad taking notes and I wanna make a change to the model, the model is right there. So I just asked them, I said, hey, I want to use X-Design for a project I have coming up and they agreed to sponsor this video. So I wanna thank Dassault Systems for sponsoring educational content like this on YouTube. You guys were a big help and have been a joy to work with. If you wanna find out more about how X-Design or the 3D Experience platform can work for you, there's a link in the description. Check it out. Let's zoom in here real tight and take a good look at this first motor. This is a stepper motor, NEMA 23. It's got a two and a half to one gear ratio. This is the motor which is driving the blade up and down. Looking on the inside, there's a pretty complicated shape which allowed for multiple things to happen. This entire housing slides up and down and that's for getting the proper spacing between these two gears here. This entire assembly has to be able to ride on the same shaft that it rotates as the carriage moves left and right. So here we have a bearing housing and then there's a bolt 
that protrudes through here, and that keeps this from rotating the body of my assembly instead of rotating the shaft. Zooming out, you can see another custom 3D printed mount, which holds onto my e-stop button and my start button. Here's the cabinet that houses all of the electronics and stepper motor drivers, things like that. And now we get to what I feel is the most crucial part of this device, and that's a really solid, reliable fence. My fence is driven by a rack and pinion, as you can see here. And this is why I love engineering, because there's so many options and there are always pros and cons. For example, across the width of my table, I've got a six foot span. If I put a ball screw here, that ball screw is gonna be pretty large, expensive, and the travel speeds are gonna be slow. Rack and pinion gives me faster speed, but I'm gonna have some backlash in the system. Now, I can't explain what backlash is here, but I'll put a link in the description that'll lead to more information. Now, for my personal needs, the backlash here is negligible. I'll always get acceptable parts out of this. If I wanna measure a part in thousandths of an inch, I would avoid the table saw and probably also avoid the material wood. It doesn't mean it can't be done, this is just not my preferred tool for the job. Zooming into the fence itself, you can see I've got a three by six piece of extruded aluminum. Now that is definitely overkill for this application, but this serves two purposes actually. It makes the fence really stiff since I'm only holding it from one side, and also all of the slots give me a lot of flexibility with adding auxiliary items to the fence itself. All right, that's enough detail from the 3D model. Let me show you how I built this thing. Instead of making a drawing, I'm just gonna pull the dimensions right off of the model. So if you see me picking up my iPad here, it's because I'm basically clicking edges and hitting the measure tool. And that's how we're gonna figure out how long these cuts need to be. So let's hop to it. All right, fortunately the camera couldn't see the huge mess I just made. So let's start cutting up some steel. If you're wondering why this saw looks so weird, it's because it has been significantly modified. This is a project from a previous video, so there's a link in the description for that. I love these little magnetic squares. I bought a whole bunch of these for this particular project, knowing I was gonna be welding all this square tubing. I started by making these little boxes first, and then later on we'll join the boxes together. I'm using a CNC to drill the holes here, but there's no reason you couldn't drill this with a regular drill and some careful measurements. This is where you want to take your time and make sure everything is square and fit together by just tacking it. Then we'll get into welding everything solid. Well, I uh, might have forgotten to put this hole in the middle, but uh, we're just gonna pretend like it was always there. Electrical panels like this, I always buy at industrial auctions. And in this case, I actually bought three at a time. It was a really good deal. These holes are being drilled so that they can be tapped a little bit later. And here's a quick breakdown of the main electrical parts. There's gonna be a proximity sensor here, as well as here, and those will tell me about the limits of travel for the fence. But I also need to capture the limits of travel for blade angle as well as blade height, because there's a high probability I'm gonna put in a number that's too large and ram my fence into the end of the machine, for example. There's gonna be a point where you run out of travel and the motor is still trying to push because of probably user error. I've chosen to use proximity sensors. You could also use these really cheap sensors. These are limit switches, and then you can get more robust limit switches like so. The one difficult place is measuring the blade height. It's not so bad with the fence. When the fence gets here, I have a bolt sticking through that's adjustable, and I've got a limit switch on the backside. That tells the machine, hey, you need to stop. You're about to hit the blade with the fence. 
What's more difficult though is measuring the blade height. I don't want to put the sensor in a place that moves with the blade height because obviously it's never gonna measure anything. It also can't be completely stationary with the table because as the blade angle changes, I will no longer be able to measure the blade height. And that doesn't leave very many places on the machine, at least ones that are accessible. I wanna be able to get in there and replace them fairly easily if there's a problem. All right, going back to zero. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we got it. <laughs> All right, let's make some steel pieces and get to work. All right. Nice. So at this point you think we're done, right? Like the thing is built, you've written the code, which you'll see here in a moment. Listen, I just checked the footage and there are more than twice as many hours left of me scratching my head, staring at the computer, trying to figure out why this thing is not working. Let's try just moving in a couple inches, maybe three. Well, crap, that sounds the same. How about 10? Okay, let's check the wiring. I ended up spending hours debugging my program, pulling almost all the wires back out of the cabinet because I had massive interference. This reminds me, when I posted that video about that big plasma machine you saw earlier, uh, several people asked the question, they said, why would you build such a large machine as your first CNC machine? And I thought about that for a while and I realized something about myself. Typically the harder the problem is, the more interested I am. I would say the same thing applies here. When I decided I wanted to learn how to code and I saw people doing things like hello world programs, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to write something challenging. And so why not write a CNC program for my table saw? I don't know, it's just me. And I think I've narrowed the problem down to the relays. So I've got a mechanical relay in there now. I'm gonna tell the fence to go to 43 inches. The sensor's at about 41 and a quarter, so that's where it should actually stop. Yes! Oh! Oh, I'm too tired, keep doing this. Okay, the problem was the relays. I'm gonna go get something to eat. We have a solution now. Oh man, I should probably turn the camera off. Last thing to check is to make sure that automatic dust collection is working, and then we're good to go. Considering I manually adjusted this to zero before I started the saw, I'm gonna call that a success. <laughs> so here's the user interface. And as you can see, there's a built-in calculator and the three variables we wanna manipulate on the saw. All the numerical inputs come from the calculator and populate the other fields. So if I wanna move the fence to 10 inches, I'll hit 10 on the calculator and hit grab number. And that will pull whatever number's in the calculator. Initially, I had designed it so that if you hit move fence, whatever number was here is exactly how far the fence moved and there was no real confirmation. That led to errors because sometimes I'd move the wrong thing or think of it as like when you hit the delete button and it says, are you sure you wanna delete? That's kind of what this is. I went back and added the grab number function so that I would pull the number over, I could see the number on the screen and confirm it's the fence that I wanna move 10 inches. So we'll hit move fence and as you can see, Fence moved 10 inches. Oh, that feels good every time that happens. The next, the other two work the same way. So if I wanna change the blade height, 1.25 inches, I'll hit grab number. I wanted to maintain manual functionality of the table saw. And what I mean by that is I have a button over here. When I hit this button, that releases all of the motors so that I can nudge the fence or even nudge the blade up and down. 
having that button allows me to quickly switch between manual functions when I want to just nudge something a tiny bit without measuring it and more precise and faster functions with the CNC. The machine is free now and the computer no longer knows where it is. What I would do at this point is push it to an even number just for simplicity's sake. It doesn't have to be an even number. Okay, and the fence is at six inches. So I'll come back over here, hit six, grab number on the current position, and bam. The fence is now at six inches, and I can go back to CNC functionality. Grab number, there we go. And now we're back in business. There's a couple other features I've added here. So if we're at 25.4 millimeters, and I wanna switch that to inches, then I can hit uh, millimeter to inch and it'll do the math for you and switch it. So then we're back at one inch. That was really convenient for me because my brain tends to think in both metric and US customary. So sometimes I'll come over here, I'll put in a metric number and then I'll remember, oh yeah, all the stepper motors are calibrated to inches. So then I can just quickly convert between the two. After using the saw for a while, I realized that I should add some shortcuts down here and that's what you see these four buttons are. This is a uh, one inch on the blade height and zero because either I want it to be flush with the table so I can move to the fence to the other side, and yes, it works on both sides of the blade. The only other scenario is one inch so that I can cut pieces of wood that are three quarters of an inch or less. I rarely cut anything thicker than that, and when I do, I can just type in the number that I want. Here's a really quick look at the code. As you can see, it's written in Python. I've commented out different sections to try to make it easier to read. There are places to control the speed of the motor, to calibrate the number of steps per unit of whatever measurement you wanna use. And as you scroll through, you can modify the buttons. Pretty much everything can be modified, of course. For me, watching people code is kinda of like watching golf. I love to play it. I don't really care to watch other people play. I'm gonna turn this off and let you guys go and download it yourself if you wanna play with it. I've got a running list of questions you might ask and things I wanna change about the program. So let's run through that. Number one, I wanna add some acceleration to the motors. Right now, they just sort of take off at full speed and slam on the brakes. However, acceleration is a bit tricky for me. Again, I'm an amateur, so I need to ramp up the speed for some percentage of the duration of steps, slow it back down, and also keep track of how many steps I've taken so that I don't go too far. I don't know how to do that yet, but I'm working on it. The back side of the fence slides on a recycled block of HDPE. I'm thinking about adding a cut list function to the program. That way you could enter all your dimensions in advance and just hit next instead of going in and entering each dimension as you cut your wood. I'm not entirely sure I would use that, but it seems like it'd be a nice function. I usually post my videos early on Patreon and also I post pictures and project updates. And one of you asked there about the e-stop, like what does it do exactly? In this case, it only stops the blade. I thought it was safer to leave all the other motors engaged. I don't want the fence to suddenly break loose if I'm trying to stop everything. Well, if the fence is moving and you wanted to stop, that seems like a much less dangerous situation to me. You would just reach down and hit the disable button instead of the e-stop button. Speaking of safety, you'll notice that there's a handle that spins around as the blade goes up and down. That seemed like a great idea at first, you know, use a dual shaft motor and have access to the shaft through the motor itself. But now I realize that it could snag a piece of clothing or something like that. Now the motor on the fence actually protrudes a little bit more than that handle. So you probably wouldn't be standing that close to the saw. But eventually I'd like to rotate that motor 90 degrees and put a bevel gear there. And then the handle will be completely inside the angle iron and there's very little risk of you actually getting caught by it. Why stepper motors? Why not use servos or those hybrids with the encoder feedback? And the short answer is cost. In this case, I have a known variable. I can actually measure how much torque it takes to rotate the handles, and I did. I know what speed I want to accomplish, and therefore I know how much power I need. This allows me to size the motors properly. Stepper motors are dumb, and they're gonna go exactly where you tell them to go every time unless they're overloaded. As long as you don't overload them, you're good to go. How to size your motors properly is definitely something I want to talk about in a future video. This project was pretty hard, but boy, it feels good when you finally get it right. Anyway, thanks for watching.